Now, grab your Bibles. Grab your Bibles and turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Man, it's good to be in the Lord's house today. We are, we are going to cover, we're going to cover the first half of this uh, particular chapter tonight. Uh, I, I, usually we've been trying to cover the whole chapters, but it's just not going to be possible. Uh, this chapter is broken up into two parts, a prayer and a prophecy. And the prophecy is a response to the prayer he gives. Uh, and so tonight we're going to look at the prayer of a prophet, the prayer of a prophet. It is, it is, it is really, really deep. We're going to, we're going to, uh, get some really meaty material tonight. Uh, something that's going to be an encouragement to you. Uh, and, and, and listen, I hope it is a challenge. I hope it is a challenge. If there's ever been a time that God's people need to be people of prayer is right now. And what, what caused, what caused Daniel to be that man of prayer? We all know, we all know that he prayed already, right? When he was going to be thrown in the den of lions, he would wake up three times a day. He would get up, open his windows and pray back to Jerusalem. So prayer wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't a stranger to prayer, but this prayer was different. This prayer was intense. This prayer uh, was a prayer of fasting and, and sackcloth and ashes. And, and so, but what triggered it was prophecy, prophecy. He was doing, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I just got to tell you, he was doing what you're doing now. He was looking at prophecy, studying prophecy. And I, I, want, I want you to pick up on this. I, I need your response to be what his response was. We, we shouldn't just come to hear prophecy just to say we know a little more about what's going to happen in the future. It should cause a response. And so that's what we want to see tonight. Daniel chapter 9 in verse number 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. In the first year of Darius, the son of ah Ahasuerus, whatever you want to call him. I've tried it 17 different ways and it's oh, oh Mr. A. Amen. Of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years, where, uh, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer, supplications with fastings and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done it wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto the servants, the prophets which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces. Confusion means shame. He said we should be ashamed of ourselves, as at this day. To the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to all Israel that are near, that are far off through all the countries, whether thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face. Shame to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his ways, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse, say that with me, the curse. is poured upon us and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him and he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges and the, the, our judges that judge us by bringing upon us a great evil for under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem as it is what? Written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. 
Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he doeth. For we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and hast gotten thee renown or, or, or uh, a reputation, uh, glory, honor. As at is this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem, and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. The re word reproach there means a disgrace. Now, therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that it is desolate. For the Lord's sake, O oh my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O oh my God, for thy city. And thy people are called by thy name. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm so grateful. Lord, I'm thankful to be in a place that is concerned about your word. And they have a desire to study it and know it. Lord, I pray that you'll just allow me to share some of the things that you have showed me and given me. I don't deserve to be here. I, I'm, not even, I'm not even remotely uh, in, in any way thinking that I deserve to be in this place. But Lord, I am so thankful. I'm so thankful for your salvation. I'm thankful for your calling. And Lord, I'm thankful for your spirit and the anointing, Lord, that, that you have given me to deliver your word. And I don't take it for granted and I appreciate it. And Lord, I love it and I thank you for it. And I beg you for your touch tonight. Don't let me say anything I shouldn't and don't let me forget anything I should. I pray that you'll touch every person in this room, every person watching online, every person in, in, in Fairview, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you will fill our hearts with a fire of you and who you are. And God, I'll praise you and thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Let's just try to stay with our notes because if I start running rabbits tonight, we will never get done. Number one, <clears throat> number one, the Bible says in verse chapter nine, verse one, in the first year of Darius, the son of Mr. A of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years Wherefore of the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So number one, we're talking about the prayer. The prayer is the main subject tonight, okay? Everything, every point is going to be dealing with the prayer of Daniel that he gave in this particular chapter. And so the first thing I want you to see is the prompting of his prayer. The prompt, what motivated, what, 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 what made him even make this prayer? What made him go to God in the way that he did? What prompted the prayer? Two things that I want you to see. First of all, I want you to see his devotion, his devotion. He was a man of the word. He was spending time in the word of God. He was spending time in the scriptures. He was reading the prophet Jeremiah. Now, what, what do we, what do we take from that? We need to be people of the word. Our, our prayers, our prayers should be motivated by and prompted by the scriptures that we read. You say, preacher, I don't have a good prayer life. Most of the time, if you don't have a good prayer life, your devotional life is not that good either. But if we will spend time in his word, if we will spend time in the scriptures, if we will spend time with God in his word, it will prompt us to want to talk to him. It'll, it'll prompt us to want to learn more about him, want to get close to him. It'll prompt us to want to understand what we are reading. Listen, it was the word, the word, the word provoked him. The word inspired him. The word uh, motivated him to pray. 
We see his devotion. Then B, I want you to see his discovery. His discovery. I tell you this, if you'll get in the word, you'll discover some things. Seek and ye shall find. Say it with me. Seek and ye shall find. You have not because you ask not. He had a discovery. Say, what did he discover? Look in verse number, verse number two. <clears throat> Daniel said, I understood. I understood. I learned something. I discovered something. By books, the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet. He was specifically studying Jeremiah and even more specific, chapter 25 and chapter 29. Now let's look at what he, was, he found out. He's in his daily devotions, if you will. Maybe, maybe he is in the morning time and he is reading the scrolls or the scriptures that he has at the time. And as he's reading, this is what he read. Jeremiah 25, 8. Are you there? It should be right in your notes. It should be right in your notes. Jeremiah 25, 8. This is what he read. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and a perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take away, take from them the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride and the sound of milk. In other words, anything that brings rejoicing, he's going to take it away. The sound of the millstones, that has to do with food and the light of the candle. And this whole land, this whole land shall be a what? Desolation. Desolation, Desolation means white clean, desolate, nothing there. And an astonishment, watch now, watch now. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon, say it with me, 70 years. 70 years. He flipped over to chapter 29. In Jeremiah 29, 10, it says, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. He made a discovery. There's going to be 70 years. The Bible says in verse 2, in the year... In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the numbers of the years, wherefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the what? Desolations of Jerusalem. Now, I want to I teach you something. I, I didn't put it in there because I didn't have room to put it in your notes, but if you want to write these uh, texts down or addresses, you can go look them up later. In Leviticus chapter number 25, Leviticus chapter number 25, verse number 2. The Bible says, now now keep in mind, this is the Levitical law or the law of Moses, right? This is what, when, when, when Moses and the nation of Israel left Egypt and they got to Mount Sinai, it was at Sinai that God taught them how to live, taught them how to worship, taught them how to dress, how to behave, how to, how to be a society, how to be his people. In other words, what he expected out of them, the rules for life, the rules for living. Are y'all with me? Say amen. Amen. Now watch what he says. In the law, this is what God commanded the people. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field And six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather fruit in thereof. But in the seventh year, say that with me, in the shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest shalt thou reap. Neither gather thy grapes of thy vine undressed, For it is a year of rest unto the Lord. In other words, he's telling them every seventh year, you cannot plow, you cannot prune, you cannot work the field, you cannot 
You cannot plant whatever comes up, whatever comes up on its own, that's what you can have. There's, there's so many things there, and I don't have time to go into all the reasons. One of the reasons is for the, the benefit of the land. So you don't just, just soak out every nutrient and mineral and all that. God knew what was best for his land. It was an also, now watch this, this is important. We're going, we, we might talk about some of this Sunday morning because some of y'all are really scared to death right now about what's going on. But it was, this, this Sabbath year was an opportunity for them to trust God. It was an opportunity for them to depend on God for their well-being. Depend on God for their provision. Depend on God. They should be doing it all the time, but they would really have to do it in this seventh year. Now, now, so we know every seven years, you got to leave it alone. You got to leave it alone. There is a Sabbath for the land. Say that with me. There is a Sabbath for the land. Now watch this. Second Chronicles chapter 36. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 14. This is, this is a historical writing of what happened. Moreover, 2 Chronicles 36, 14 through 21. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent them to them by his messengers rising up be times and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling. What's going on? The nation of Israel is rebelling. The nation of Israel is committing a, a, a spiritual adultery. They're bringing in idolatry. The people around them are influencing them in their religious worship and they're bowing down to false gods. And God is sending messengers. He is sending prophets he is sending preachers. He is sending servants to warn them and tell them because he is compassionate toward his people. Over and over, multiple times, God would send people to warn them. Verse 16, but they mocked the messengers of God. They despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore, he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees. We well, you know that's Nebuchadnezzar who slew their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young men or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God and break it down the walls of Jerusalem and burn all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon. You say, preacher, we know all this stuff. Patience. So he's killed and had no mercy. And those that survived, he took away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Watch this now. Here's, here, here's the key. Verse 21. To fulfill, say that with me, to fulfill. fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land, here it is, until the land had enjoyed her. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and 10 years. Three score, scores 20, that's 60 plus 10 is 70, 70 years. Preacher, what's going on? Because of their disobedience, because of their idolatry, because of their wickedness, because of their rebellion, they went 490 years without a single Sabbath for the land. That is 70, 70 Sabbaths they were behind schedule. So God says, okay. Now, now this is important. This is important. When people sin, it affects where they live. Now think about it. Humanity is destroying this earth. And what's more important is the land that they were destroying didn't belong to them. You say that, that's their land. It's God's. It's God's. 
And he said, okay, if you're not going to do what I tell you, I'm going to put you in time out. Until all the Sabbaths are caught up. You see, if it was just, if it was just a, a point of them repenting, if it was just a point of them being broken, if it was just a point of them being contrite and, and sorrowful, they could have they been defeated and then God just brought them right back. But he said, no, 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 no. My land is going to enjoy its Sabbaths. So for 70 years, he kept the nation of Israel in bondage until those, those Sabbaths were fulfilled. That's what he discovered. Now watch this. This is, this is, an, unusual, this is an unusual situation if you really look at it. Think about this. Daniel was taken as a young man, most likely a teenager. He's taken from his homeland. He's taken from everything. He's taken from the temple. And, 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 and he was probably of royal seed, most likely. And now he's been here almost 70 years. Right at 70 years. Now, as he's reading and he's studying the prophets... He studies Jeremiah's writings and Jeremiah said, hey, this is going to happen. It happened. Jerusalem destroyed. It happened. The gates destroyed. It happened. The, the temple will be destroyed. It happened. They will be taken into captivity. It happened. They will be servants of Nebuchadnezzar and his sons. That happened. But guess what? There'll be 70 years and we get to go home. Now, my response, I, I, I just feel like at that point he should have said, yes, yes, it's almost over. It's almost over. But that's not the response. This was not a response of jubilation. This was not a response of rejoicing. He didn't jump up and down and said, bless God, this thing's almost over. Can, are y'all seeing where I'm going with this? That's what I would have thought his response would be. But verse 3, we see his response. We, this is the prompting of his prayer. Do y'all see it? The devotion, the discovery, what he finds out. But I'm afraid it wasn't just the fact that the, the years are almost up. It was what caused it. He realizes the sin the wickedness, the rebellion, the disobedience. And that causes the spirit of his prayer. Verse 3. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fastings and sackcloth and ashes. The spirit of his prayer. Now, Today, today we see people all the time in a religious fashion talking about fasting and, you know, oh, I'm a fast, I'm a fast from Facebook and I, I'm going to I'm I'm fast from, from chocolate milk or, or whatever, you know, you see different stuff all the time and, and, and they totally miss it. They totally miss it. Nowhere, nowhere do you find a command to fast in Scripture, Old Testament or New Testament. Fasting was a, a voluntary thing that took place when your soul was broken. When there's deep sorrow. In other words, fasting comes from the point that you're so broken about whatever the issue is that you're praying and fasting about. You don't even want to eat. And ashes, ashes upon the head, ashes upon the body always came from grief. When people would grieve, they would put themselves in sackcloth. Sackcloth was a very itchy garment. It was like a, it was like a bag that was, of, imagine, of horsehair, something very prickly, something very uncomfortable, something that, 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 that would just cause irritation and pain. And that was a reflection of what was on the inside. 
It was a reflection of what you felt on the inside. So preacher, what, what are you saying? I, I'm telling you this, when he studied the prophet, when he, when, he, when he studied prophecy and he found out what God's word said, it broke him. It broke him and humbled him and his prayer was a spirit of repentance. A, grieving and mourning. If you'll look at Job in Job 42, 6, when, when Job really seen God like he really was, he said, wherefore I abhor myself and repent. Say it with me. And repent. Everybody say it. And repent in dust and ashes. He was broken. Had ashes to, to represent his sorrow, his mourning, his grieving. But there's something good about sorrow because it'll cause you to repent. Second Corinthians seven ten, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. You say, what's the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow? Godly sorrow is you're sorry, you're remorseful, you're broken because you broke God's law. The sorrow of the world is you're broken because you got caught. Because you're having to pay a penalty. There's a difference between being broken because you, you, you broke the law. You didn't mean to, but you broke the law. And there's a difference between you broke the law because you meant to, and now you got to pay the ticket. But godly sorrow will always lead you to repentance. It will always lead you to turn. It will always lead you to be different. When people come to the altar and they pray and they say, Lord, I, I repent, but they go back and leave the same way and they live the same way. They do not turn. Don't tell me they did not repent. Repentance is a turn. Repentance always comes from godly sorrow, a brokenness, a contrition, a sorrow over your sin and who it is that you have sinned against. He was so broken. He came humbly in his prayer. He came repenting. I mean, he's confessing his sins, the people's sins, the nation's sins, everybody. We see repentance. It's a spirit of repentance. It's a spirit of contrition. Contrition means brokenness, a broken heart, sorrow. Psalms 34, 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. And save as such as be of a contrite spirit. The sacrifices of God, Psalms 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken, a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Amen. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabit eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Preacher, what are you saying? Our nation needs to repent. Amen. Our churches need to repent. Yeah. Christians need to repent. When we see, when we see uh, 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 prophecy and when we see the things that are going on, we, we, we need to quit whining and we, we need to quit blaming the government. We need to quit blaming the, 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 listen, everything that I see and say, God, we are where we're at because you're sovereign and you're allowing it. God, we are sorry. We are broken. Nothing can happen in this country without the, the allowance of God. Nothing can take place without God's hand allowing it. it. We are reaping what we sowed. That's right. That's right. We're killing babies by the millions in the womb. Listen, drugs, alcohol, and all of the things. Pornography rampant. We're reaping what we sowed. We need to start looking at this like, what, what, what do we deserve? We, you, you might want to be careful about that. Because Daniel, and let me tell you something, Daniel, Daniel was probably a good kid. We saw his, his, his honor. We saw his character in the very beginning when he would not eat the king's meat. He would not drink the king's wine. He was an honorable man, but he's seeing the sins of his people, the sins of his nation. I'm telling you, Christians around this country should be broken right now. We are, listen, we are coming before a holy God and he's sorry. 
He's broken. He's realizing. And I, I think he's coming to the understanding of truly why he is in Babylon. Number three, I want you to see the content of his prayer. The content of his prayer. I promise you, you spend time in God's word, it'll change how you pray. It'll change the spirit of your prayer. You'll realize. Well, let's, let's stay with it. <clears throat> Number three, the content of his prayer. Verse four. We see the inside. His brokenness is a contrition, sackcloth, ashes, and fasting. He said in verse four, and I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. First of all, if you're writing notes, write this down. The content of his prayer, we see number one, the recognition. Before he ever asked for anything or said anything, he recognized who he was praying to. Verse four, and I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, watch this now. O oh Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Two things he's recognizing here, the person of God, the person of God, great and dreadful. Dreadful doesn't mean like, oh, that tasted dreadful, like a bad thing. Dreadful means awe, it means reverence, it means fearful. In, start, in other words, when, when they knew the, the presence of God, the, the nations of Canaan, uh, when they knew God's presence was coming, they were filled with dread. They were filled with fear. They were filled with, in, in a state of awe. And what Daniel is saying here, he is humbling himself and recognizing who he's praying to. He's not talking to his buddy down the hallway. He's not talking to, and, 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 and I, I'm telling you, I, I see people all the time reverencing the man upstairs or, or the big guy or, or that is so disrespectful and so irre, irreverent. And, and we need to understand that when we pray, when we pray, we're praying to a holy God. We're praying to a perfectly righteous God. We're praying to the one who holds your air that you breathe in the palm of his hand. He said, you're a dreadful God. You're a great God. You're a powerful God. You're a mighty God. There is none other like you. I remember, I remember Jordan's wedding. I remember Jordan's wedding and we, we, we were, we were, uh, uh, we, we were trying to do things and, 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 and it's always a hassle. Uh, weddings are terrible. <clears throat> and, and, and there was, there was going to be a transition because Jordan wanted me to do the wedding, but I got to walk her in. Y'all with me? Well, Austin wanted his papa to be part of the wedding. So he was going to do the first part. And, and, and I was going to walk her in. And then, and then when he, when, when I'm presenting the bride to Austin, me and his papa would switch. We were trying to figure out a good place to do that in a good way to have a transition where it's kind of smooth. Y'all know what I'm saying? Me and Susan were, Austin's mom was sitting there talking and Susan's daddy is, is, is his papa. There's a pastor who's going to do the other part. And, and Susan said, Susan said, well, I tell you what, why don't we just have somebody pray and y'all can just switch and that'll be a good transition. I said, suits me. And we went to tell her daddy. And when Susan told her daddy, he looked at both of us and said, that will not work. We don't use prayer as a transition. Prayer is talking to a holy God. Yeah. So yeah, Susan. Man, I'm telling you, he meant it. And he was right. Listen, when we pray, you know, we, I, I think, and, and I've been guilty of this myself, when talking about food, we, we, don't even, we don't even just even think about our prayer. God bless his food, amen. Do we realize who we're talking to? We're, we're human beings who are made out of dirt talking to an infinite God in heaven. And this is what I want you to see. Daniel knows who he's praying to. 
Daniel knows the, 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 the awesomeness of the God that he is seeking. And he's recognizing his person. He recognizes who he is. Uh, listen, it's the same thing that the Christians did in the early church in, in, in the book of Acts when they were threatened and, and they came and they told him, listen, they've told us not to preach in his name. The very first thing they said, thou art God who's made heaven and earth. Amen. I'm telling you, if we would start recognizing who we're praying for and be in reverence of him and in awe of him, I, I'm telling you, it would change the way we pray and it might change the outcome of our prayers. He recognized his presence. Not only, not only did he recognize the person of God, but he recognized the practice of God. The practice of God. Look what he says. He said, not only are you great and dreadful, but you keep the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. In other words, and you're going to see this once we get on to the next verses. What, what, what is he doing by this? What is he doing by this? He's saying, God, you made the covenant, you made the agreement, and you kept your part. And you'll see that as we're going. God said, if you'll do this, I'll do this. If you'll obey me, I'm going to bless you. If you'll, if you'll do this right, then I'm going to do this. And what, Dan, what is Daniel doing right here? He's saying, God, you made the covenant and you kept your part. Yeah. You were faithful. Yeah. You did what you said you would do. Amen. Now watch. We see the recognition, then number, or B, we see the confession. In verse 4, he said, you kept your side. Keeping the covenant, you kept that. And guys, that, was, that came from glory right then. I didn't even have that in the notes. I just saw that. He said, you kept your side in verse four, but watch what we did. You kept the covenant. You kept the mercy. But we, verse five, we, say it with me. We, we have sinned. And have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings and our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. Three things I want you to see. First of all, they can, he confessed what they did. And it was twofold what they did, their actions. First, they didn't live right. And now watch this. Where do you get that? Verse 3. We have, I mean, excuse me, verse 5. Excuse me, verse 5. We have sinned sin and have committed iniquity. and have done Wickedly. and have Rebelled. even by from thy precepts and thy judgments. I would say that's bad. That's their behavior. Can you agree with me that he's saying we didn't live right? Amen. Now watch this. Watch this. This stood out to me. Verse six. He's confessing what we did. First of all, verse five, we didn't live right. Watch this. Verse six. Neither have we under thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name. We didn't live right and we didn't listen attentively. The word hearken means pay attention. Now I need everybody to pay attention right now. See the difference? Some of you come to church all the time and you listen, but you don't pay attention. Because if you did, you wouldn't leave like you came. Sometimes we leave here, we leave here and we get to the car and if they was to ask you what was preached on, you wouldn't remember. Because you're like a lot of men. You're staring dead in your wife's face. And she's telling you 13 things, but she sees that far away look in your eye. And then she asks the dreaded question. Are you listening? And we always say this, yeah. <laughs> and then y'all always say this, what I say. Uh -oh. 
Now we're using a little humor here because this is pretty deep. But what's the difference? What's the difference of, of, of leaving? And if the Holy Spirit met you in your car on your way home, what would you say if he said, what I say today? You, you, you were more interested in what game's coming on today. You, you were more interested in what you was going to eat after lunch. You was more interested in your schedule that you got to do this week. You didn't pay no attention to any. You listen, but you didn't pay no attention. Our country's not in the shape it's in because of politicians. Our country's in the shape it's in because of churches. And the churches are in the shape they're in because of the Christians that are sitting in them. They're in there all the time. I'm, I'm talking about uh, every time the doors are open, but they're not paying attention. It's not just listening. It's being, being in the vicinity of a preacher and hearing noise does not fix you or change you or strengthen you. It's when you pay attention. They heard the prophets. They just didn't pay attention. He confessed what they did. They didn't live right. And the reason they didn't live right is because they didn't listen attentively when God tried to get their attention. He confessed what, what we did. This is Daniel. When I say, well, you can put they there because that's what I keep thinking in my head, what they did. But we, I might as well just say what we, because we're, we're, America's guilty too. What we did, look at the second thing, what we deserve. Watch this. Watch this. This is, woo. Oh, Lord. After he confessed what they did, verses 5 and 6, then he says in verse 7 and 8 what they deserve. Verse 5 and 6, what we did. Verse 7 and 8, what we deserve. O oh Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. The word belong means appropriate, means suitable. Righteousness suits the Lord. It's appropriate to address him with that title. But unto us. Confusion of faces. What, what did I say that meant? Shame. Shame. You deserve to be called righteous, but all we deserve is shame. The men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, in other words, the ones that's left, because there was a small remnant, unto all of Israel that are near, that are far off through all the countries, whether thou hast driven them. What's he saying? We all should be ashamed. Because of their trespass, they have trespassed against thee. O oh Lord, to, to belongeth confusion of face or shame. Shame. From the kings to our fathers, because we've sinned against thee. He's confessing what we did. He's confessing what we deserve. He's confessing what they defied. This is, this is stout right here. He's confessing what they defied. Y'all know what defy means, right? Verse nine. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him. Watch now. Watch how, we, watch, watch, watch how we rebelled against God. Neither have we obeyed the voice. That's voice. Who's the voice of the Lord? The Holy Spirit. We didn't obey the voice of the Lord to walk in his. What is that? That's the scriptures. Which he set before us by his. Servants, the prophets. What they defy, preacher? They defied the scriptures of God. They defied the servants of God. And they defied the spirit of God. Every single Sunday, servants of God will open the scriptures of God 
and be led by the Spirit of God. And our mind is a hundred miles away. And we're saying it's not important. I don't need this. But you see, that inattentive listening calls them to live wrong. The recognition, the confession, see, the confirmation. Man, this is big. The confirmation, verse 11. Yea, all Israel has transgressed thy law, even by departing that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon. I want you to underline that in your Bible. Here's, here, here's how I, I underline. I underline, therefore the curse is poured upon us. All right. And the oath that is written, where? In the law of Moses. Underline that. I forgot to. Somebody throw me a pen. All right. Because that's important. The law of Moses, the servant of God. Because we sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his, word. underline that. He hath confirmed his words. It says, which he spake against us and against our judges that judge us. Now watch this. How do he confirm it? How do he confirm it? This is how he confirmed it. By bringing upon us a great evil. That means their dispora. The desolation of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, the destruction of the city, the destruction of the walls, them being taken into captivity. Look what it says. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is in the law of, underline that, all this evil has come upon us. Watch this now. This is so big. Please, please, please get this. Please, please get this. <clears throat> Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Quickly, quickly. I only got 11 minutes. While you're turning, Deuteronomy is the second law. Say that with me. The, second law. the first law was out Mount, at Mount Sinai. Y'all remember? At Mount Sinai, he gave them the law. He gave them the instructions. He gave them their responsibilities. He gave them their duty. What did they do? They got to the promised land and they refused to go in because of their unbelief. They were, they were forced to go back out into the wilderness to all the ones above a certain age died off. And now they're coming back. They're coming back. Are y'all with me? They're coming back ready to go in the promised land now. And what's he do? He reviews the first law. That's the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the second reading of the first law that we find in Leviticus. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. In other words, God is reminding them one more time. God's reminding them one more time before you go in. This is what I'm going to tell you. It shall come to pass... If thou shalt hearken diligently into the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed shall thou be in the city, blessed shall thou be in the field, blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thine kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in and blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. That's a lot of blessings, people. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand unto. And he shall bless thee 
in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, and he has sworn unto thee. That's that covenant. He has sworn unto thee. If thou shalt keep thy commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways, and all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord God shall make thee plenteous in goods, and the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee, the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure. The heaven is to give thee rain unto the land in his season to bless all the works of thy hands. And thou shalt lend unto many nations and thou shalt not borrow. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only and thou shalt not be beneath. If that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I commanded thee this day to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. But, but it shall come to pass. It shall come to pass. If thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these, what? All these shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shall thou be in the city. Cursed shall thou be in the field. Cursed shall thou be thy basket of thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thine land the increase of thine kind and the flocks of the sheep. Cursed thou be when thou comest in. Cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, rebuke, and all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do until thou be destroyed and until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. And there's so much more. But if we go back, if we go back before Israel went into the promised land, he said, if you'll obey me and follow my word, I'm going to bless your socks off. But if you rebel, I'm going to pour unto thee these what? Curses. Verse 11, Daniel 9, verse 11. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us. What curse? The curse we found in the law of Moses, the servant of God. So what, what is, man, I feel Satan attacking my body. Help me. Y'all pray that I can breathe. <clears throat> The, the, the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, the captivity, all of that was given in the book of Moses. And what did it do? Verse 12. Verse 12. You ready? Yeah. He hath confirmed his word. Now everybody's sitting there saying, why did they have to go through this? And all of it was confirming that God will do what he said he would do. Now, you, why is that important? Why is that important? Because in the end of this chapter, we're going to read some things that he says he's going to do that hasn't happened yet. And you need to have confidence that if God said it back then and it came to pass, it's going to come to pass again. Are y'all with me? Say amen. The confirmation of God's word. The curse the destruction, everything. Look what it says in Lamentations. Lamentations, 
All that pass by clap their hands at thee. Talking about the, the city. Talking about Israel. They hiss, they wag their head at the daughters of Jerusalem. Saying, is this the city that men call the perfect? In other words, they're mocking the desolation of Jerusalem. Is this what you call perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? All thine enemies have opened their mouth against thee. They hiss and gnash the teeth. They say, we have swallowed her up. Certainly, this is the day that we look for. We have found, we have seen it. Watch this now. The Lord hath done that which he had devised. He hath fulfilled his word. He done what he said he would do. That he commanded in the days of old, he hath thrown down, he hath not pitied. He hath caused thine enemy to rejoice over thee. He hath set up the horn of thine adversary. What are you saying? I'm saying if you do this, I'm going to do this. And they did that and he did that. And Daniel in his prayer, he's confirming that God's word is true. The confirmation of God's word. Number two, quickly, the, con the confirmation of God's righteousness. This is big too. Verse 14. Verse 14. You there say amen? amen? From verses 11, from verses 11 down to verse 14, he's talking about God confirming everything that happened, the curses, the, the judgments, the desolation, everything. All it did was confirm the word of God that he would do what he said he would do. But not only that, it confirms his righteousness. Look at verse 14. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For, read it with me. For the Lord our God is... In all his works, which he, for we obey not his voice. You know what Daniel is saying? God, it's not your fault. It's our fault. You're righteous. I, I know, I know it seems, and in, in, in the nation of Israel probably seen this as such a terrible blight and such a, such a terrible thing. How could God allow the desecration and the destruction of the city and the temple and, and the, the captivity of the people? You know what Daniel's saying? God, you're right. Yeah. 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 Righteousness. Righteousness means right. God, you were right in doing that. You were right in allowing the judgment. You were right in bringing Nebuchadnezzar in. You were right in taking us into captivity. You were right in the desolation. Now, why do we need to see that? I believe what we're experiencing right now in America is the judgment of God. And let me tell you something. We need to quit whining about it and just say, God, you're right. We've rebelled. We've disobeyed. You've not been a priority in our lives. We've not listened attentively. You've tried to tell us this was coming. You tried to tell us about perilous times. We've just lived our life like there'll always be a tomorrow. God, you're right. It's going to get difficult, but you're right. It's hard, but you're right. I'm in a foreign land, but you're right. Our city's destroyed, but you're right. You kept the covenant. We did the wrong. That's true confession, ladies and gentlemen. The request, mercy. We ain't gonna, yeah, we are. We're going to finish. Let's just not preach them, just tell you what is there. The request, verse 15. And now. When he confessed and said, it's us. When he confessed and said, we're at fault. He confessed and said, God, you, you just did what you said you would do. You're right in doing it. You're justified in doing it. So here's my request, Lord. O oh, Lord, our God, thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand. And hast gotten thee renown, glory, reputation, recognition. Everybody knew the God of Israel. As at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem. Thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and supplications and cause thy face to shine upon the sanctuary that is desolate. For the Lord's sake, 
Oh my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes, and behold our desolations in the city which is called by thy name. We do not present our supplication before thee for our righteousnesses. In other words, we're not, we're not coming before you because of everything good we've done. We're just coming to you because of your great mercies. Three things in his request. He said, remove. Don't be mad. Don't be mad anymore. Verse 16. I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away. He said, remove your anger. Remove, remove your fury. All that they had experienced, the destruction of the temple, the destruction of the cities, the destruction of the walls, the desolation, was all the product of the fury and anger of God. He said, remove your anger. Oh, I love this one. Verse 17. Now therefore, O God, hear the prayer of thy servant and supplications and cause thy face to shine upon the sanctuary. You know what he's saying? Return. Return. Cause thy face to shine upon thee was a, was, a, was a prayer and a blessing that the priests would pray over the people. And he was saying, let the presence of God be with you. Meaning, let the smile of heaven, let the smile of God to shine. Where? Where? The sanctuary. In other words, God, fill your house again. God, let, let your presence be felt in your city again. In your house. He says, remove your anger, restore, return your presence. And restore three things. Verses 17 and 18. Restore the city, Jerusalem, the temple. And the people. Why? Why? This is so important. I, I, I don't care if we're late. We got to finish this. What motivated him? Some of y'all, some of y'all are thinking, "Oh, I know what motivated him. He was ready to get out of Babylon. He never left Babylon. He died in Babylon. Was buried in Babylon. He was too old to go back." He said, well, what in the world was he said? Why was he so intense about this? Why was it such a big deal? If he couldn't go back to visit home again, if he could not go back and see the, 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 the return of God's people, if he couldn't go back and see the rebuilding of the temple and the rebuilding of the walls and the glory brought back, why was it such a big deal? 15, he builds up to it. Verse 15. Watch this. You'll see it and it's going to just. Pew. Now, O Lord, our God. Thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand. In other words, what you did and the way you did it brought great glory to you. Everybody, when they heard the nation of Israel coming, it scared them to death because they knew there was a God with them. And he said, by what you did with your people bringing them out of Egypt, you had great renown. You had great glory and reputation and honor. Yeah. And then he said, we sinned. We messed that up. We brought a reproach to your name. But your glory. Then he says this. Watch this now. Verse 16. O oh Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee. I beseech thee. I beg thee. Let thine anger and thy fury be turned away. Watch this. From thy. Come on, say it with me. From thy city. Thy holy mountain. Thy people. Verse 17. Thy sanctuary. For the Lord's. Verse 18. Oh my God, incline thine ear and hear upon thine eyes and behold our desolations, the city which is called by thy name. 19. Oh Lord, hear, oh Lord, forgive, oh Lord, hearken and do, defer not for Y'all seeing it? 
for thy sake. Thy city. Thy people are called by thy name. It's not about the people. It's not about the gates. It's not about the walls. It's not about the temple. It's about who they represent. It's the city of God. It's the house of God. It's the people of God. It's the glory of God. Daniel was broken because he knew their sins had desecrated and disgraced the glory of God. God got glory when they delivered them out of Egypt. They, were, they said, you were a person of renown. You had all this glory and we messed it up. God, we're sorry. Restore it for your name. Restore it for your glory. Restore it for your honor. Restore it for your glory, God. I'm going to tell you, when we get a right spirit about our prayer, our prayer will change. Our prayer will, it'll change from make the gas prices go down. It'll, it'll change from make the politicians act right. It'll change that God, you get glory however you see fit. You get glory out of my life. Whether I live, I live under Christ. Whether I die, I die under Christ. I do all things for Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. We're sitting around belly aching. We're sitting around sucking our thumbs. We're sitting around crying and worrying to death. Listen, it's about the glory of God. God will provide because of his glory. God will supply our need because of his glory. God will do what he said he would do. Somebody say amen. We don't need to worry. We don't need to fret. Daniel said, hey, you just can, everything that we're experiencing right now, you just, you said it was going to happen and it happened. But guess what? He also said after 70 years, they get to go home. God said perilous times shall come. I'm talking to us now. But he also said, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to be with them in the clouds. He said there'll be wars and rumors of wars. Yeah. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. But he also said, listen, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in yeah. me. Yeah. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare you a place. And if I go and prepare you a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also. Hallelujah. Yeah. And all God's people said, Say this with me. Everybody say this with me. He'll do what he said he'll do. And all God's people say it. 